Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to welcome you to our Impact of Lead, Past, Present, and Future. Thanks for joining us bright and early, and even with a little bit of snow. I expect we'll have people coming in, given the time, uh, as we're talking, which is fine. Um, I'm Melissa Baker. I'm a Senior Vice President at USGBC, and I'm happy to be here to, to kick things off and to talk with all of you this morning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. Um, I joined USGBC in June 2007 to lead our efforts with the government sector uh, in market development and to really help them implement leads to support their energy and sustainability uh, and energy independence goals. I came from the Department of Energy where I was a fellow uh, working in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy in the Weatherization Assistance Program. And I'm so proud to stand here today before all of you as the leader for LEAD. When I joined USGBC 11 years ago, I really didn't have an idea that I was going to be doing this someday and actually be responsible for USGBC's contribution, for the <coughs> contribution to the impact that we're making on the planet. And it's been quite a journey for us as an organization and for me personally as well. In our session today, we're going to go through the evolution of LEAD from our past to the present and, of course, touch on the future as well and what we're envisioning for our next generation of LEAD. But first, I really want to thank you for being here and for joining us. It's very important for us at Greenbuild and in other engagements that we have with you to help advance LEAD, and I hope you'll see how we're leveraging your feedback to make our products work harder and smarter for all of you. We're really now at a time where we're doing things with LEAD, and I think, you know, both organizationally and with your work, that we maybe didn't think were possible when we first started. And this year is USGBC's 25th anniversary. 25 years ago, we started with the vision to transform the places where we live, work, learn, and play within a generation. And really, at 25 years, we're about at a generation. That's our first generation, and a lot has changed in that time. 20 years ago, we created LEAD. I bet some of you were probably around when that first work was being done, trying to measure and define green buildings, setting a baseline, a universally agreed upon holistic system that would reduce environmental impact from the built environment, have a goal of reducing carbon emissions, and of course addressing climate change. Now, when people know they're in a LEED certified building, they are using less energy and water, avoiding waste, saving on maintenance costs, improving indoor air quality, offering comfort to occupants, and creating less environmental burden on their community. We know that they are in a building that enhances health and wellness, because of course, all the work that we do around green building is about people. And after its introduction, the LEAD program was embraced by a collective group that spanned industries, art architects, designers, engineers, developers, business leaders, so fast forward 25 years to today, green building is a trillion dollar industry, and LEED is the most widely used green building program in the world. To give you a little history, in 2000, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation Philip Merrill Environmental Center in Annapolis, Maryland, was our first project to achieve LEED Platinum, and the Candelama Hotel in Sri Lanka became the first certified hotel and the first certified international project. Now we have more than 44,000 commercial projects, totaling more than 7.3 billion square feet of space, and that's across 167 countries and territories. More than 17,000 of those are outside of the U.S. LEED is truly global. In 2002, we had the Third Creek Elementary School in North Carolina, which is the first elementary school to achieve LEED gold. Today, we have more than 2,100 certified K-12 schools and more than 4,600 4, certified buildings at higher ed institutions. In 2003, our U.S. General Services Administration mandated LEED certification for federal projects under their management. And today, more than 2,300 certified federal government buildings 
More than 1,000 state buildings and more than 3,000 local government buildings are certified. And as you can imagine, that's close to my heart from the work that I started out doing. Also in 2003, National Geographic became the first LEED certified existing building. And today there are nearly 6,200 LEED certified existing buildings. As you'll hear later, we're looking to just continue to scale that number and blow up that number of existing buildings, but we continue to be super excited about some of the firsts. In 2004, Chicago Mayor Richard Daley announced that all public buildings would be required to achieve LEED certification. And today, we have rating systems that cover neighborhoods, communities, and entire cities. So far, 11 cities and communities have certified to LEED, including Chicago. We have 38 more registered. And with the recent announcement of the integration of STAR, this uh, rating system for cities, with LEED, the total number of LEED certified cities grows to 84, with 57 more in the pipeline pursuing certification. In 2005, we had about 20,000 LEED APs, people holding the credential uh, individual credentials. Today, we have more than 201,000 people worldwide with a LEED AP. <laughs> Hopefully, everyone here is getting their two CEU hours. LEED specific, too. In 2008, we launched LEED for Homes. And today we have more than 448,000 certified residential units. So we can say during our first generation, we've enjoyed much success. But it's really just the first chapter of our story, and now we're preparing for the next one. During our first generation, different versions of our lead rating system progressively pushed the global green building community forward. First, sorry about that. There we go. We inspired the community to think about lead, and then to work on implementation. And now we're changing, we're evolving, we're pushing the rating system to help all buildings perform the lead standard. After the really widespread success we had with lead version 2009, we wanted to raise the bar on the market. And as leaders, it's not our, just our job to be efficient in construction and design, but also to really be aspirational, to give to the environment more than we receive. I know everyone's familiar at this point with LEED version 4. V4 was designed to be the most rigorous green building rating system in the world. But much like the world we live in, our ongoing commitments at USGBC, and especially with LEED, they're works in progress. They're constantly evolving, as goals and needs change. So with this in mind, and as we announced last year at Greenville, on March 26th, we introduced LEED version 4.1, a series of upgrades designed to improve our standards, encourage leadership, and make our platform more user-friendly and more accessible. We started with LEED for existing buildings. Hopefully some of you are working on a beta project right now. <coughs> We don't want to leave really 90% of buildings behind. We can't if we're going to realize this vision of sustainable future for all. The lead version 4.1 for existing buildings, we fully integrated the ARC platform, making lead version 4.1 the first green building standard in the world to do that. And so now we can say that lead is truly a performance standard. Today, I'm very excited to announce that we will soon launch version 4.1 for new construction, interior design and construction, residential, cities, communities, and of course, transit. <laughs> we'll give you a lot more detail throughout the session, but this is just a quick timeline for everyone on the launch dates for each rating system. Um, I'm happy to share that we will also embed full performance outcomes powered by ARC into these rating system updates as well. 
<laughs> so when we set out to develop lead version 4 back in 2012, it took us about five years. But I'm proud to say lead version 4.1 is getting accomplished in just under one year. <laughs> Maybe some of it's a little closer to 18 months or so, but hopefully you'll let us claim that 12 month timeline. I really want to thank, personally thank, the leadership of our lead steering committee, our technical advisory groups, all of our committees and working groups, and of course my wonderful staff and countless others who move mountains to make this happen. We really appreciate it. And of course, <laughs> excuse me, I want to thank our full extended team who supported the effort. The release could not have happened without our leadership and the support of these groups and individuals. Lead version 4.1 has really fundamentally transformed the rating system development process, and it has allowed us to become more agile, adaptable, and incorporate real time feedback so that we can realistically raise the bar on the marketplace. <laughs> when I think about the future, I start to ask myself a lot of questions. And I guess that happens when you think about lead, when you're responsible for lead. Is 4.1 our future? Is performance the future? Is the new residential program our future? What about cities and communities, existing buildings, human health, all the new technologies that go into buildings, virtual reality? And of course, that's all part of Lee's future. But then when you start to weave all of that in, a whole new set of questions comes up. And the first one, of course, is how do we actually get there, and in a realistic time frame. But knowing all the high achievers here with me on the stage, in this room, and outside in our community, I know we'll get there. We need to make sure that 4.1 is successful, and success is truly defined as transformation driven by implementation with true measured outcomes. It's clear that performance is our future. So with this in mind, we announced a new program on Tuesday. We set our sights on zero. <laughs> Building on lead version 4.1 and recognizing the leadership of projects that have committed to net zero across our lead community, we've introduced a new net zero certification program. It gives the green building, a new green building community a new standard to strive for, LEED Zero. It's a certification for net zero carbon and or net zero energy, water, and net zero waste. So you can achieve one or many of those based on 12 months of operational data within a project that's been LEED certified. And as you'll hear a bit more as the other speakers join me, uh, one of the big steps that we agreed to with LEED version 4.1 was to raise the bar on energy and to really further the leadership of projects by moving to an, a reference standard of ASHRAE 90.1 2016 and also for the first time adding a carbon metric to the rating systems for both new and existing buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we now have a carbon metric in LEED, which is very exciting. And it's part of that vision to ensure, as Mahesh talked about on in the opening plenary yesterday, the vision of the organization that USGBC's efforts are towards lead positive, where buildings are generating more energy than they use, removing more carbon than they produce, and are healthy and equitable for all people. The other thing that I'm very pleased to announce today is that we're moving to an ongoing performance-based certification and monitoring model. All lead projects starting back in version one through 4.1, past, present, and future, can now recertify by providing 12 months of performance data. And the recertification is valid for, 12, for three years, excuse me, with annual reporting. We think that it is time, we believe that it is time, for all projects to demonstrate leadership and stay certified to continue to demonstrate that leadership long after they are constructed and occupied and after their initial certification. We're really joining together to improve quality of life and we're very excited about where we're headed. I hope that everyone saw the announcement that came out on Tuesday as well between USGBC and BRE. 
Um, we have teamed up to accelerate progress globally in buildings, communities, and cities. This partnership will promote the expertise of both organizations and harness combined industry insights to deliver a new approach to green building performance solutions and benchmarking. And the collaboration allows us to further leverage our tools and resources with the goal of scaling up reductions in carbon emissions associated with buildings and to accelerate on all fronts. With our common vision to move the market forward, we really need all hands on deck. And the combined power of the two leading green building certification programs, LEED and GREEN, will help power a new way forward. The joint vision is to use our mutual strength to meet the world's current and future urbanization needs. And as I think everyone's pretty aware right now, over the next 40 years, two trillion square feet of new and rebuilt, rebuilt buildings will be constructed worldwide. I saw one stat that said that was about one New York City every 35 days or so for the next 35 years. So it's a huge global impact. And if there's one theme that I've really heard repeated from folks throughout the conference so far, it's that the urgency of action is here and the time is now. And people are really ready to take that action. I know everyone's familiar with the IPCC report um, about a month or two ago which indicates that climate change is worse than previously thought and that we need urgent action to limit global warming. So we want to prove to the rest of the world that what we've done in the past 25 years is working, and we're ready to build on it, and go even further in our next 25. I'm very proud of what we've accomplished in the past, and even more proud of what we've been able to do this year with LEED version 4.1. And I'm excited and optimistic about our future. After all, the next generation is expecting us to do the right thing for them. So now let me introduce our esteemed panel. <laughs> With me today is Corey Ink, our VP for Lead Technical Development. Corey has been leading tech dev for the lead rating system for about the last 10 years. We're thrilled to have Corey continue to lead this work. I know he's excited to share the details of our, our vision for LEAD. He collaborates with our volunteer technical committees and industry stakeholders to evolve and refine LEAD. His commitment to LEAD and dedication ensures that we have the best rating system to reach our market goals. And Corey is joined by some of our volunteer leadership to introduce the updates for LEAD version 4.1. And after we do our updates, we'll also have some time for Q&A and, and discussion with you all. Also with me is Gina Bokra, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer at the New York City Department of Buildings. Gina has 23 years of experience in sustainable design, including a Master of Urban Environmental Planning. And at the Department of Buildings, she's working on implementing New York City's One City Built to Last plan. She leads the DOB team of specialists charged with developing procedures to enforce the Energy Code, and supports continued development of the New York City Building Code as well. Gina is currently our chair of the LEED Steering Committee and is also a LEED Fellow. Amy Costello is the Sustainability Manager at Armstrong Flooring. And Amy is responsible for developing and managing sustainability strategies and initiatives and chairs the Armstrong Flooring Global Sustainability Steering Committee. Amy is on our USGBC Board Advisory Council. She chairs the Indoor Environmental Quality Technical Advisory Group and ASTM Sustainable Manufacturing Subcommittee. Paula Zimmon is a business director at Stephen Winter Associates. Paula's Sustainable Building Services Group focuses on sustainable, sustainable building and energy efficiency strategies for new construction, commercial interior renovations, and existing buildings. Paula has a particular passion for energy and over 10 years of experience with building energy modeling. She's currently the chair of our LEED uh, Energy and Atmosphere Technical Advisory Group. And Dana Schneider, who was our last speaker, unfortunately was not able to join us. She's a managing director at JLL, um, but we do have some thoughts for her that Gina will share as she's speaking. Uh, and she definitely shares her regrets in not being able to be here. So thank you, everyone. I'm excited to get into the technical meat of the session, and I'm going to turn it over to Gina. Thank you. Um, 
So I'll try and give you a sense of what Lead Steering Committee and the TAGS have been doing to bring Lead Version 4.1 to, um, to the industry. And so um, we're always competing with um, sometimes competing goals and constantly trying to see where the vision for lead should be going next. And the vision overall, I don't think, has really changed since the beginning. The vision is how do we create better buildings and better places that enrich our lives and are better for our environment. So that's always guiding the decisions that we make with the, with the um, LSC's work and with, with the tags. But I think uh, over the last year, we've said, let's step back and let's make sure that as we're working on all of the credits, let's look to a couple different lenses. So the first lens of uh, climate and carbon, um, we spent a lot of time, and that was a big priority for us uh, as we were doing our work on, on version 4.1. And as Melissa said, we've raised the bar in some way. And we've introduced the carbon metric into LEED, which we're very excited about. We're also using the lens of resiliency as we're talking about how the credits should be evolving. Uh, the other two, human health and social equity, also come into play. And we, we believe that we should be using those filters as we're looking at how all credits should evolve, not just one or two of those lenses for credit. So, that's been guiding the tag work and the work of LSC as we've been looking at how 4.1 is going to evolve. So through the process, we were really supported by a lot of work from the staff. Um, what kind of feedback were we seeing on how credits were performing? And so they gave us a tremendous amount of data that helped us look and, and determine where should credits go so that they're um, not requiring a huge amount of effort with only a little bit of impact as the result. What we want is real outcome from the credit and a, a reasonable amount of effort to achieve that outcome. In addition to that, we also had a lot of input from stakeholders. We had stakeholders that came to us and said, you know, we have this urgent issue of climate change. We need the to better address carbon. It always has addressed carbon. And we feel that maybe we just haven't been as explicit about how a lot of the credits within LEED really are addressing climate change. But we also felt like it was time to modify some of the reference standards so that we make that response stronger. Uh, we also had a um, call for proposals, and that came out a couple months ago. We got really great response from the industry with about 250 ideas that came in and many of them have supported things that we were already talking about within the tags and within the lead steering committee. And so, you know, it, we, taking all of that data on how credits were performing, what the industry thinks is necessary for lead to continue to evolve, the four lenses of uh, how they sh each credit should be, be um, impacting climate change, resiliency, social equity, and human health, and then in addition to that, um, looking at UGAS GDP's commitment to the Paris Accord and trying to also contribute to meeting UN Sustainable Development Goals. All of that has inspired and driven the work of the Technical Advisory Group. And my colleagues here are really going to get into the details on that. So I think I'm most excited because of my work on a day-to-day -day basis in New York City about how we're modifying uh, energy and atmosphere credits to better respond to carbon, how we're raising the bar to 90.1 2016, which is um, not even adopted yet in any jurisdiction in the United States, but will be very soon. And so we were um, very enthusiastic that the, the TAG came back and said, we are ready to make this leap. Um, it's very critical that we start seeing better energy performance from buildings. So we're very excited about that, and I think we were really proud of the work that the Energy and Atmosphere Tag did to come to that conclusion that we really can go that far and raise the bar to 90.1 2016. But we do think. <laughs> 
not just about raising the standard, it's also about better messaging about how each credit really impacts climate change and, and how it affects carbon. And so that's not just the energy and atmosphere credits, but also materials and resources. And that's where we still have a little bit of work to do. It's not, um, we didn't forget about how important embodied carbon is, and the tags are still working on that, um, that progress. So there are some structural changes that we've also talked about. Um, I don't know if any of you in the room attended the session yesterday on need and climate change, but there was a suggestion that a lot of the things that we're looking at are so intertwined that we should just have one big giant credit on carbon that pulls in the requirements of a number of the credits that we have now, and we really like that idea. Now, we have a lot of work to do to figure out how we make that work in the rating system, obviously, and what kind of information is available to the users of, of LEED, how do they get the input for metrics, what metrics we, should we be using, and we've, we've really uh, come to a lot of agreement that the metric of cost does not serve us well anymore. It's still an important metric. But we need to be looking at other metrics that show us how buildings and places are really performing on carbon. And so we have that idea. We also think that we need to look very carefully at the approach of having one rating system that serves all markets. That tends to maybe not drive performance the way we want it to. And so We've talked a lot about how we may need to change the scale within LEED so that um, e emerging markets and evolving markets are uh, maybe addressed a little bit differently than well-established markets. So that's something that the tags are also uh, contemplating. And that might mean that we have some segmentation. And so that's, that's a struggle. We want to make LEED simple, but we also want to make sure that it's really performance-based. And so there is also more fo focus on performance data. So we're very excited to think about how projects should recertify in the future, what kind of data should we be getting on an ongoing basis, and how do we support um, building owners so that that data is really useful to them. I'm excited about that because we have had benchmarking and disclosure in New York City for a few years now, and a number of studies have been done to see what what kind of impact is that really having? So now owners are aware of how their building performs and how it performs in comparison to other buildings in New York City, and it affects about 40,000 buildings in New York. So what we've seen is that you know, there's some variation on the data. We also have a retro commissioning and energy auditing law that hasn't impacted that entire set of buildings yet. So that's still coming into transition. So about 30% of the buildings that report their benchmarking information have gone through that energy auditing and commissioning process. But the studies are indicating that those buildings' energy usage has reduced anywhere between 3 and 14 percent. So it really does help owners to see that information on an ongoing basis, and I'm really excited that LEED is moving in that direction as well. So when we think about the future, again, we, we recognize that we need better metrics, metrics that not only inform the owner, but also help um, the industry as a whole. We also want to see the cost of documentation go down. We want credits to require an appropriate amount of effort to do the documentation in order to achieve the outcome and the goal that we're trying to achieve with them. And we understand that in lead version four, we kind of missed the mark on some of that. So that's a big um, change, I think, in 4.1 that everyone, I think, will be really happy about. So in some cases, thresholds, thresholds have been lowered in credits where we didn't see the amount of uptake that we were hoping for. And then, you know, as in energy, some thresholds have been increased. So. Another issue that we're looking at is how, um, how buildings need to have sort of good grid citizenship. So especially when we're looking at BD and C, ID and C, it's not just about the building anymore. And we're, becoming, we're coming to recognize that we really need to better understand 
how buildings are good citizens on the grid or grid harmonization. And that has become more important in LEAP version 4.1. Buildings can only do so much. We also need to see how they can influence and improve the grid. And as we've been doing all this work, we still are struggling with the same issues that have always been there for me. We can only do a certain amount of change at a certain, within a certain time frame. And so we're always trying to figure out how can we achieve incremental change that improves the market but doesn't shock the market. So I think that we found a nice balance with version 4.1 of changes that are going to be easy to absorb but not push it so hard for the market to really respond. And in addition to that, we're always looking at how we raise up the bottom. So we've, we've looked a lot, and Melissa talked about how we felt it was important to raise the bar for projects that are at their top performance, projects that are pursuing platinum. And it's very important that we keep pushing those, but we also want to pull more projects in. So there's a constant struggle between how do we make it easier and how do we make it harder. So we're still trying to capture all buildings in, in this work that we're doing. And uh, so Melissa mentioned Dana, who is, uh, comes with an owner's background, is not able to be here with us today. And she wanted us to share a couple different thoughts about how we've been doing our work with LFC and with the tags. And one of the things that she thinks is really important is that we continue um, proving the business case for LEED. Uh, we have a really long way to go to get to 80 by 50, and that's a, the United Nations have established that as our goal. It's the goal that we've adopted in the state of New York and in New York City, and that's an 80% reduction of carbon emissions by 2050. Most owners have no idea how we're going to get there, so it's really important that we continue to show them that this is um, a really effective system in helping them to move towards that goal. And her observations are that people really do want to do the right thing. And so through these, these credit changes, it's really important that we continue to signal to the market that it doesn't have to cost more. And so that's something that we're also keeping in mind in, in our messaging about these. But she agreed that we have to collect more data and is very enthusiastic about um, recertification and continuing to, to bring in the amount of performance data that's informing both lead and the owner. And that this is really a priority for where we need to go in the future. And I think I'm, I'm going to sum it up with a quote that she wanted to share, and that was that we need to prove that it makes money, and we need to prove that it saves money, and that we were all going to win with this. start to get into a little bit of the detail of this next version, 4.1. Uh, but first I wanted to throw out a, a thought question to the audience. How can we continue to lead as a standard for high performing buildings? So I'll let you think about that for a few seconds um, and keep that in mind as we talk through all of this detail over the next, over the next few hours here. Um, we also have a Q&A section at the end, so if there's something you didn't see in 4.1, feel free to, to bring it up and, and we can certainly discuss it. Um, but this is the question we ask all of our stakeholders when we start any new development cycle. And 4.1 is, is a direct response to all of the answers we've gotten to that question. Um, and just to give you a little more context behind this newest update, um, 4.1 is an incremental update to lead. So version 4 was a comprehensive update. Uh, we spent uh, we spent five years developing version 4. Uh, 4.1 is, is not that. 4.1 is a more focused update. We want this to be quick to the market. We only want to adjust a few things within this rating system. So we want to make sure that all of the project teams that have spent time learning version 4 uh, really don't need to learn, learn anything new to 4.1. Um, it'll, it'll come pretty quickly, uh, given that the, there are targeted, focused 
uh, updates. Um, and our goal here is still market transformation. So um, we think adjusting version 4 with this 4.1 update really will uh, kickstart some of the transformation that we've already seen and accelerate that transformation over the next couple of years. Uh, so one thing I'll, I'll mention with version 4.1 is we are following a slightly different process for technical development. Um, with version 4, uh, like I said, we kicked that process off in, in 2009. We spent four years developing the rating system. We went out to six public comment periods. We had 22,000 public comments that we got. Um, but we, we still felt that we didn't get the feedback at the right, at the right time. Um, with 4.1, like Melissa and Gina have said, we want this to be more targeted. We want this to be quicker to market. Um, so we are, uh, over the last six months, we have developed this draft based on the call for proposals that Gina mentioned. Um, we will then be releasing it into a beta. So projects will start to be able to, to use this rating system right away. And I think that'll be really helpful uh, to get real-time feedback from projects and to have that feedback affect the rating system and make changes during that beta period before we actually enter public comment. So once we enter the public comment period, which should be um, the end of, of 2019, based on how much feedback we're getting, um, we really think that we won't need to have six public comment periods. We won't need to have 22,000 comments that we respond to. We think we will have necessarily worked through all of the kinks and, and gotten all the feedback we, we need. So hoping this beta period really provides a, a, a new model for how we can, can develop rating systems quicker. Um, so after we go through the beta, which will largely be the, the year of 2019, um, we will enter a public comment and a, a ballot for the rating system. Uh, one thing that has not changed within 4.1 is the system goals. So how many are familiar with the lead system goals for version 4? Okay. Some of, some of you. Um, these have not changed. These are essentially the values behind me. This is, this is why we do the rating system. Uh, this is, these are, these are the, the main things we care about. The credits are essentially proxies for, for these things. So these are, these are seven system goals. We spent um, the large part of a year developing them and prioritizing them. Uh, climate change and human health are, are our top two goals. So these won't be changing for 4.1, and these are important to understand because they do drive all of the credits and all of the requirements within our rating system. Uh, so um, to keep this rating system <coughs> focused and to keep our development cycle um, as, as sort of nimble as we can, we did have to develop a set of goals to help us and all of our committees focus all of our work around 4.1. So our first goal for 4.1 was really to ensure that LEED remains the global leadership standard for green building. That's our goal with every development cycle. That's, again, our top goal with, with 4.1. Um, as I mentioned, version 4 came out in, uh, st we started development on version 4 in 2009. That was nine years ago. It was launched in 2013 at Green Build Philadelphia. That was five years ago. So a lot has changed in that time. Uh, a lot has changed in the last five years. Uh, so we need to, need to reflect those changes that the market has gone through and make sure that LEED is still retaining its position as a leadership standard. So many of the credits that, that we'll talk about today um, are reflecting goal number one, maintaining the leadership standard in the market. But a second goal, and, and potentially uh, a goal that has affected more credits within the rating system, is really starting to address all of the feedback that we've been getting from version four. Um, so it has been out in the market for five years. We've gotten great feedback. We've seen a lot of market transformation in those five years. Um, the materials conversation has really progressed over the last nine years, especially since V4 has been out. Um, energy has, has really progressed. We've seen uh, things like envelope commissioning, building and closure commissioning, really uh, getting some momentum in the market. So there are many success stories with, with version 4. Uh, but there are also stories about uh, stalled market transformation and, and areas of the rating system that we can certainly adjust to start to kickstart some of that some of that transformation within the market. So 
Goal number two is really removing those market barriers that are present in version four and making 4.1 um, more accessible to projects uh, to really start using these good ideas. And it all goes back to the this line, which I like to use. So lead is successful when we balance these two, these two interests. When we balance the abilities of the market with the urgency for environmental solutions. Um, if we, if this is out of balance, if, if, if lead is too hard, no one, no one does our rating system and we don't really achieve our goal of market transformation. If it's too easy, um, we're also not achieving our goal of, of, of providing environmental solutions. So we really need to, to, to maintain this balance within the rating system uh, to continue to, uh, to transform. So um, that's something we evaluate um, on a regular basis with, with all of our, our credits. And I think one thing that we can use with 4.1, one thing that we can look at is really our credit achievement data. And that's what you can see here on this scorecard. So we look at all of our credits. We see which credits are working, which credits are not working. Uh, as you can see here, uh, green credits have a higher achievement rate. Blue credits have a lower achievement rate. Um, why do they have a low achievement rate? If, they, if, if projects are not attempting these credits or earning these, these credits, we're really not getting the, the benefit we need. So we have taken a look, all of our committees, staff have taken a look at those credits with low achievement rates and really tried to understand how we can, how we can adjust those requirements to, to kickstart that transformation. Um, and that's, that's essentially what we're looking at here with, with version 4.1. So the third goal is, is to expand the market. Um, with version four, we put out a lot of new ideas. Um, some of those ideas might not be applicable to all projects. Uh, so with 4.1, we want to make sure that we are uh, adjusting credits, revising credits, so that, so that more credits apply to more projects. I think that can apply to something like the cooling towers credit. Um, that was a, a new credit we added in version four. Um, Cooling towers are a, a huge uh, water consumer on, on projects, but only on projects that have them. So that takes a point off the table for projects that don't use cooling towers. How can we adjust that credit to really um, include all projects in, in that, uh, in meeting that intent of, of water conservation? Um, demand response is another good example. Another a great idea that was added in version four, how can we start to expand that credit to apply to more projects? Uh, and then also, how can we expand leads and make it work better internationally? Uh, version 4 spent a lot of time focusing on this, adding new international requirements and compliance paths. How can we continue um, that trend and, and really unlock uh, leads for regions of the world that aren't using leads? And then lastly, performance. Um, how can, how can lead measure performance and quantify, quantify performance better? Uh, this was a major theme of version 4, so many of the changes you'll see in, in version 4 directly address um, this, measuring performance. How can we take that another step further with, with 4.1 and continue to, uh, to add requirements around uh, collecting metrics and to continue to connect new construction with operations and maintenance and, 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 and make that transition a little smoother and ensure that buildings are performing as intended. So a few other updates um, with version 4, we will also be addressing our residential rating system. Um, a few changes here. Uh, we do hope to, um, we are planning to align all of our residential requirements. So previously we have had residential requirements in our PDMC rating system, we've had them in our mid-rise rating system, we have a single family home rating system. Uh, with 4.1, we do plan to consolidate all of those requirements and put them in one rating system called Lead for Residential. Um, we also plan to uh, streamline those requirements once they are uh, consolidated and start to add new compliance paths for, um, for projects outside the U.S. So we're excited about what we're doing with, with residential. We think that'll make a lot of um, project teams' lives a bit easier trying to understand how their residential project fits with LEED. And then operations and maintenance. We spent uh, a lot of time on this rating system, and this rating system has seen uh, more significant change than others with this 4.1 update. Uh, the O&M rating system was launched into beta back in February of this year, uh, and we already have 
200 plus uh, projects registering and, and using this, this rating system with a few certified projects. Um, this rating system, uh, well, with existing buildings, we have a huge opportunity uh, for environmental uh, change. Um, in Leeds, we have not seen the, the, the type of uptake we want with existing buildings. And given that they are such an opportunity for, uh, for savings, um, we took that to heart with these 4.1 updates and made this, this version of, of O&M uh, more streamlined, uh, more data-driven. Um, we've made this rating system more directly connected to performance. So we think that the changes we made in operations and maintenance, which is now powered by, by ARC and the performance scores within ARC, will help us scale this rating system um, at a larger rate so that we can start to pull in more existing building projects into LEED. So specific goals for the o and rating system, focus on those performance outcomes, really start to measure performance in every category that we can, uh, use data as documentation, so really reduce the burden on projects, make this rating system simpler, more streamlined, uh, more cost effective. Um, we think by focusing on performance outcomes, this will also be more applicable for more projects. So outside the US, this rating system will be more applicable. Um, one change that we're very excited about is that O&M now does apply to interior spaces. Uh, traditionally, O&M has only applied to whole buildings, and we've never made that change. Now that we have this more streamlined version, um, it does effectively address interior spaces. So we're excited to see um, that new sector of the market using O&M. Um, we've also scrutinized the prereqs within O&M and try to identify where we did have any market barriers. So you'll see that we did adjust the prereq, uh, specifically around energy um, and also for ventilation. Those, those prereqs were identified uh, historically as, as barriers to entry. So we've, we've tweaked those, hoping to include more projects into this, into this rating system. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this rating system does, uh, does allow for annual reporting. So given that we are looking more closely at performance data, um, annual reporting is included in this, in, this, in this rating system. So recertification should be uh, much simpler and much uh, lower of an effort for projects. <coughs> and here's a version of the O&M scorecard. So you can see that it is uh, significantly condensed. Um, so this should be much less daunting for projects to take on. And we do have performance score credits within five of those categories. Again, that comprises 90 of the points. So we really are serious about focusing on data as part of the certification process. All right, so I will get into a little bit of the, the detail of 4.1 BDMC uh, at this point. Um, and I'm going to talk about the first three categories, so location, sustainable sites, and water. Um, and these three categories do not have any significant changes, so I wouldn't say that you'll be too shocked by any of these changes. But we did make very small changes in many of these credits that uh, I think will have a very big impact on, on, on uh, achievability of some of these credits and, and how projects can, can score within these. So for locations, um, one of the credits we addressed first was access to quality transit. This was a credit that we uh, updated in version four, um, trying to make this more performance-based in terms of measuring the amount of trips that the transit has. Um, one of the things that we've continually heard as a barrier for this credit was uh, the request for weekend trips. So we've adjusted that requirement. We've lowered the, the threshold for how many weekend trips you actually need. Uh, because this was shedding out large, large portions of the market. Um, so that small change, I think, will have a big benefit in terms of earning more points within access to, to quality transit um, and really uh, earning higher levels of certification. Uh, bicycle facilities. So again, another credit where we've made some small tweaks that uh, really should open this credit up to, to lots of projects. Um, we've adjusted the shower, shower requirements for high occupancy projects. So this means that large projects like the Shanghai Tower um, won't be required to install 6,000 showers in their building. Um, 
it's a little more reasonable now for, for those higher occupancy projects. Uh, 6,000 is an exaggeration. Um, we've also, for this credit, added a few things. Uh, bike share is proliferating. Um, we've included that as, uh, as an option, as, as an option for bike storage um, for this credit. And um, the bike network requirements, we did broaden that definition of, of what qualifies or how we define a bike network in this, in this credit. Um, all right, on to reduce parking footprint. Um, so this one was restructured. We simplified the thresholds for all, all projects. Um, and we added a few additional options. So now there are three additional options. One for um, not having off-site parking, one for car share, and one for unbundling your, park it, uh, unbundling your parking uh, in your building. Um, we've also removed the carpool requirements uh, based on a lot of feedback we got. So you no longer are required to have specific uh, parking spaces uh, signed or with sign, signage for, uh, for carpool and spots. Uh, and then lastly, electric vehicles. Uh, this credit was green vehicles. Um, this is an example of, of a credit where we have seen significant change since the V4 was launched. Um, electric vehicles are also proliferating. Um, so we did modify these requirements to, to take that into consideration. So this credit does now focus entirely on electric vehicles. Um, we've removed the requirement to have uh, signage and spots for um, fuel efficient vehicles. Uh, that was a requirement that never really worked well and was hard to enforce within the rating system. So that, that AC Triple E score has now been removed. Um, in its place, we just have uh, charging stations, requirements for charging stations. But we've also added another option for projects that do not want to install charging stations. They can install the infrastructure for future charging stations. All right, on to sustainable sites. And again, a few small changes in this category. Um, Protect or Restore Habitat has surprisingly or unsurprisingly been one of the credits that has had a low achievement rate in all versions of WEED. Uh, so we did adjust the thresholds uh, within this credit. We've also clarified some of the requirements. Um, we think some of the requirements around soils and vegetation were, um, were a little daunting. So we clarified those requirements and also adjusted the um, the requirement for off-site conservation. So we lowered the, the cost for that off-site conservation. And then lastly, in this category of rainwater management, uh, I think we've really taken a step forward with V4 in terms of the new methodology that we use for rainwater management. Um, but I think we set the thresholds a little too high. So we adjusted those thresholds within 4.1. Um, we also clarified what, what counts and what doesn't count when we talk about low impact development. Um, also recognizing that many lead projects are also zero lot wide projects or urban projects. We did significantly adjust the, the requirements for those zero lot line projects. And then lastly, talking about water before I hand it over to Paula to talk about energy. Um, water did not see a lot of change um, one thing that we did change was um, redistribute some points within water for corn shell projects. So corn shell has been a point of feedback for us over the last five years in terms of um, corn shell projects having a difficult time meeting just the minimum certification level. Um, so we readjusted some points to try to uh, reflect the appropriate scope for a corn shell project given that they have usually less scope than a, than a new construction project. So, we reallocated points from the interior, or sorry, the indoor water use uh, credit to the outdoor water use credit and to the cooling tower and process water credit. So hopefully that um, makes corn shell uh, a little more attainable uh, in terms of the scope and what they have to work with. And then lastly, uh, cooling tower. So like I mentioned, this is a, a good addition to version four, but got a lot of feedback that um, you know, what do I do if I don't have a cooling tower? How do I use credit? Uh, is it just off the table for me? So um, we took that to heart. Um, we adjusted the thresholds here uh, in terms of the uh, number of cycles for, um, for achievement. But we also added two new options for projects that don't have cooling towers. So we have a no cooling tower option. And we also have a, an option for 
um, reducing process water in general within the project. So again, hoping to put more points on the table for projects uh, to, to earn when it comes to uh, these water conservation credits. Uh, so I will turn it over to Paula to talk about energy. <coughs> How you doing so far? Did we lose you? Still awake? <laughs> okay, so let's bring energy to the table. Um, okay, again, my name is Paula Zimmon. I'm a student winter associate, and I am currently the chair of the Energy and Atmosphere Typical Advisory Group. Um, so, <clears throat> energy is the energy and atmosphere uh, category is likely the uh, category that has the most changes. Um, and the category as we've known it um, approaches building energy from a holistic perspective, at least mostly uh, from its site boundary. Um, it addresses energy reduction, energy efficient design strategies, renewable energy sources, refrigerant management, and peak load management. Um, in answering the call of the lead steering committee, um, their directives again were addressing uh, market barriers, updating requirements um, to maintain our global leadership as a standard, expanding the marketplace uh, for lead and improving performance throughout the life of buildings. Um, along. Uh, we sort of turned those, uh, those directives into sort of put some common themes within our category. <clears throat> those themes were, yes, we want to maintain leadership in, uh, as a role of a whole building energy efficiency. We must start designing our buildings with awareness of uh, carbon impact that our buildings have <coughs> in operation. And to that extent, we must expand the boundaries of LEED beyond our own project boundaries and consider how buildings can interact with the energy grid and become engaged grid citizens. So uh, we first started with the building envelope uh, commissioning requirement. There is a little bit, a piece of that as a prerequisite and within our, uh, our existing commissioning prerequisite as well as um, the enhanced commissioning credit. Um, so earlier, Melissa asked, uh, or maybe it was uh, Corey, asked us all a question, how can LEED continue to lead as a standard for high performance buildings? Well, if you were to ask me, high performance buildings, uh, pursuing LEED should both be durable and comfortable for the people who are within it. And one of our simplest ways to ensure durability and comfort is to commission the most important uh, system of a building. With the longest lifespan of any building system, the building envelope plays several roles. They keep out, uh, they keep out cold, warm, or humid air. They keep out water and pests. While, while still withstanding the gravity that um, maintains the comfort, uh, the, the gravity that buildings have to uh, work against, and maintain the comfort and allow humans to continue to connect with the outdoors. While well, market feedback indicated support and interest in this uh, in, in building envelope commissioning in version four, uh, the building envelope commissioning community had been working to improve uh, the standards to which it, it holds itself. So those efforts resulted in a new ASTM standard that was uh, recently released. And a very simple thing for us to do on the EA tag was just to uh, refer to the new standard. So a very simple thing for us to do and, and it made sense. So then uh, we next focus on to our current energy standard and energy metrics. Um, but as this topic of improving our energy standard came up, uh, we need to also consider a lot of the feedback that we received from you. Uh, that the primary feedback was how do we incorporate lead more directly into our projects. The EA tag wholeheartedly agrees uh, with the urgency to uh, incorporate carbon more directly. However, a full transition over to a carbon metric won't necessarily meet all of the goals that LEED has set. So um, what we want to, what we want you to consider a question for a moment or two, and maybe stand up and meet your neighbors while you're thinking about this, you know, stretch around. Um, think for a minute and uh, consider what should the metric be, what should be the metric against which we define whole building performance. <laughs> Anybody want to shout anything out? Stretch up, thank you. <laughs> Anybody have some strong feelings about this question? They want to shout out, I'm happy to hear it. Well, you can think about that. And again, if you need to, get up and stretch. I, I won't be uh, adversely uh, offended. 
Um, what I, I want to sort of put that question into a larger perspective of, we'll start out with the current energy codes across the US. I think it was Gina who mentioned um, that uh, you know there's variation in terms of our energy codes across the US. And unfortunately, I don't have a snapshot of what energy codes look like around the world. So obviously, we also want to look globally, but let's start with the US. Um, so this is a snapshot of uh, the energy codes across the US in comparison to ASHRAE 90.1. And as you can see, um, you know, quite a few, uh, more than 50% of our states have an energy code that is um, under ASHRAE 90.1 2010. And that is our current energy, stand, or energy standard for version 4. Um, on the flip side, about 25, the top 25 percentile um, is above 2010, approaching 2013. Um, so, you know, where should lead fall? Should I think about that. Um, uh, and where is ASHRAE going? You know, we have uh, traditionally followed ASHRAE, um, and we should be aware of what ASHRAE's ultimate goal is. They have a three-year code cycle, so every three years they're gonna change. And uh, in, I think it was 2015, um, ASHRAE did an analysis of where its the code has been since its beginning. It started in 1975, um, versus where it's going to go, or where they would like it to go, and what, what the trend is. So, um, you know, I think it's very interesting when you look at this, uh, you know, the red line represents heating equipment and how much, uh, how much more efficient our heating equipment can be. And that looks kind of dismal. It looks like we're sort of at the end of as far as we can push energy, uh, energy efficiency and heating equipment. Um, when you look at, let's say, the envelope, it looks like we can push that a little bit further. Cooling equipment, a little bit less further, but we still have some work to do there. And uh, interior lighting, uh, we can also go. So when you combine all of those together, um, ASHRAE 90.1 says maybe by 2030, we're not really going to be at what essentially is net zero. That zero line down there is a goal of net zero. Recognizing that, obviously, something's got to make that up. Um, so if we have this tradition of following 90.1 and we want to push the market further, um, I would ask you, where do you think lead should fall on this line? All right, well, I know a lot of you are very interested in net zero, and yes, I, I would agree with you that LEED needs to go to net zero. We now have a net zero uh, certification, which is great. Our energy codes, though, are also going to net zero, and they're gonna go there very quickly. And I'm, and I'm from New York. I, I, I have been working in New York City, and I've gone through 2004, 2007, 2010, 2013, and soon to be 2016 in a very short amount of time, and it drives you stir crazy. Um, so we want to limit as much as possible that, um, that negative uh, impact to the market of having to constantly learn something new. Um, so we wanted, uh, for the energy metric, we wanted to uh, adopt ASHRAE 90.1 2016. The performance rating method, or Appendix G, has a fixed um, energy modeling baseline that is only affected by algebra um, as energy codes get more and more strict. So that was the main reason why we wanted to uh, adopt 2016. Uh, but we do want to eventually go to net zero, and we're still trying to figure out what that is. What is the metric of net zero? What, what, is, the site, uh, what, what is the metric? Is it site energy? Is it source energy? Is it carbon? Um, those are, uh, are difficult questions to answer. Um, so, what, related to carbon, we have two primary concerns with the straight carbon metric, which is what I was previously talking about. First of all, market familiarity. Has anybody done an evaluation of their buildings based on carbon and made true decisions based on the carbon impact of a building in this room? Other than Chris, other than Ted? <laughs> Not many, right? Um, so we have to build up this familiarity. We have to develop a language of carbon so that we're able to speak that language on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's also a variability of carbon depending on where you're located. We don't necessarily want to penalize projects based on where they're located because their grid is dirty or over, um, uh, over accolade a project that might be in a very clean grid area that might have hydropower. Um, so we have to be cognizant of both True, uh, true energy efficiency of a building, as well as starting to change the language towards what we want to be a carbon metric. So uh, we, 
we ended up on this split metric of uh, scoring projects both uh, on energy cost, maintaining that because the market is familiar with it and is able to uh, continue those conversations with project teams and with uh, building owners where they have relationships but also introduce a, a carbon metric. So we can start having true conversations of, great, you're saving energy, maybe you're saving energy costs, but what is that actually impacted? How, is, how does this decision also impact carbon? Um, so we wanted to do that. We also, in terms of expanding our boundaries, we wanted to uh, consider offsite renewables, particularly for, uh, for the greenhouse gas emission, recognizing that your carbon uh, your carbon calculation is primarily based on what your, your greenhouse gas conversion rate is. Um, so you should be able to use some offsite energy to be able to, um, to offset that, as long as it's within your, uh, your, your utility territory. Okay, so while the building energy performance prereq and credit recognizes on-site systems and some off-site systems. I'm going to refer back to uh, the limitations uh, to being able, uh, there are limitations to be able to achieve net zero on-site, um, particularly in urban areas or depending on your building typology. Um, so if we're interested in a true carbon re reduction impact, certain locations may have an advantage just simply because of their growth. However, renewable energy and energy and finance gurus have been working out some ways very recently in the past few years to invest in renewable energy offsites. Um, in general, an onsite asset is more directly impactful to uh, offsetting carbon, um, particularly if a project can net meter. But a renewable KWH is a renewable KWH onsite or within a utility grid. Um, so in version 4.1, what we've done is we've combined the renewable energy production credit and the green power and carbon offsets credit to, uh, to broaden this overlap that we've been seeing with uh, essentially RECs and renewable energy on-site and off-site. At the end of the day, an investment in, new, in a new renewable is a way to off-site energy consumed on a project within the project boundary, and it can be done in various forms. So it's a way for us to expand the market, put more, uh, put, combine two points and three points into a five-point credit um, so that more points are available for something that can really transform the market. And then finally, um, similar to the version four O&M update, uh, the demand response credit has been renamed to the grid harmonization credit. Uh, this credit uh, directly addresses the role of buildings in supporting grid scale deharmonization. The intent of this credit update is to align across the lead versions. Um, although this version in BDC, BD and C might have gone through a little bit of an iteration. Um, within the first two options for this credit, we've made minor updates intended to clarify requirements and improve demand response implementation throughout the building life cycle. But we're also excited to uh, offer a new third option um, that rewards technologies and strategies for building load flexibility and management. We know that not all projects have access to, to demand response programs, so we wanted to reward projects for taking advantage of other strategies that have the same intent to essentially reduce grid strain. The EA tag encourages projects to be mindful of time of uh, use energy and the impact that it has on the efficiency and carbon output of the grid. Good morning. Um, I would love to stand up here today and tell you about all the changes that have occurred within the materials and resources uh, component of the, the lead rating system, but those changes are not uh, finalized uh, at this point in time yet. But I can tell you that you can expect to see changes uh, to this category that will be in line with the, the 4.1 goals that, that Corey has, has outlined, and that the intent is to maintain the original vision um, of the B4 materials credit and hopefully to accelerate the progress that we've already seen. Um, so for example, we're, we're planning um, on adding more onboarding pathways and simplifying requirements for most of the building product disclosure and optimization um, credits, addressing environmental product declarations um, and sourcing of raw materials. 
And for credits like the construction waste management uh, credit, we are looking to provide additional pathways to better um, accommodate projects with tight job sites where urban areas um, you know, find it difficult to, to separate materials on site. So that said, we have seen a lot of successes with um, the materials and resources uh, section of the rating system. And one of the successes I'd like to share with you is, is really the growth of environmental product declaration. We talked about putting life cycle assessment into the rating system for version 2009. Everybody said it was going to be too complicated, it was too hard, we didn't know exactly how to do it. And we had that same conversation with lead version 4. And we decided that if we never started down that path, we would never get there. And that is why in, in lead version 4, we added the environmental product declaration credit to really start that conversation around um, life cycle assessment. And it was more than a year. It took more than a year before the first project actually achieved the um, materials and resources, the um, uh, EPD credit. So it took more than a year for, 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 for our project to actually achieve that. And the reason was there just weren't environmental product declarations in the market. And I think what this graph is showing you is that we put this in place, we asked people to, to, to use this credit, and, and manufacturers responded. This credit was for manufacturers. And you can see before 2014 um, that, and this is a global picture, that we had a little less than 800 environmental product declarations. Today, um, we have well over 1,500 product declarations that are available um, to the market and for, for project teams to use. And this is specifically in, in North America. You can see from 2014 to 2018. And I think this is really a positive thing because it, it's allowing people to get more information about the products they're specifying and really to understand what are the impacts associated with the products that they're specifying. And I think it's also a tool. I really think that this, these credits are the building product and optimization credits are really tools for manufacturers to use to make their products better. So I also wanted to talk to you about the indoor environmental quality credit. Um, and this is the final uh, credit category that we're going to be discussing uh, this morning. But green buildings are a good um, indoor environmental quality, uh, protect the health and comfort of building occupants, high quality indoor environments, also enhance the productivity, decrease absenteeism, and improve a building's value and reduce the liability for building designers and owners. This category addresses a myriad of design strategies and environmental factors, light quality, um, air quality, acoustic design, um, control over one's surroundings that influence the way people learn, work, live, and play. And so in the, the EQ uh, tag, we have three prerequisites. We have made some changes to two of those prerequisites, really to reduce market barriers. The first is the, the prerequisite for minimal indoor air quality performance prerequisite. And in this prerequisite, there's two requirements. There's one for mechanical ventilation, and there's one for natural ventilation. And what we've done with natural ventilation is we've actually added a option um, for natural ventilation from historic or existing buildings. And so by doing this, we're allowing these users who have not been able to go for lead certification because they couldn't meet this prerequisite. It gives them a pathway to be able to achieve this prerequisite. We've also clarified outdoor air monitoring um, requirements for mechanical ventilation systems. The second prerequisite that um, we, we wanted to address was the environmental tobacco smoke uh, control credit. And we've clarified, we've, I think we've really expanded or updated uh, the definition of smoking. And this is a question that the EQ tag has received frequently, is even though this is environmental tobacco, we get, we get questions, you know, does this count for cannabis? Okay, so, and I know we've probably dealt with that regulatory in your state. Um, so the answer is yes, this does apply to cannabis uh, if you're smoking that, and it also <laughs> applies to um, electronic smoking devices. So we've clarified that definition. And we now allow other methods in addition to signage to communicate the no smoking um, policy because we acknowledge um, that project teams know the best way to manage and communicate their smoking policies within, within their project. Um, and another way that we've made lead, lead um, uh, 4.1 more accessible is by allowing lead for interior design and construction projects to be located within buildings that permit smoking. So long as smoking is prohibited in the project um, space, 
We know that this requirement is particularly difficult for projects um, located across the, the globe. So the low emitting materials credit, um, we have restructured the low emitting materials credit to be more straightforward while still promoting holistic considerations of a wide range of products installed in buildings and how these products impact indoor air quality. Specifically, we've lowered the percentage of products that need to meet the credit criteria and we've simplified the calculations that project teams use to demonstrate compliance by removing the budget calculation option. So we had two options, if you remember, there's the product calculation method and the budget. The budget was something new that we added in lead four and we realized that that did not work. We did not see project teams taking that up, so we've gotten, we've moved that um, away, away from that. We've also broken some of the product categories. So we had four originally in lead 2009 and we added three additional categories. One of the categories that we added was the ceilings, walls, and insulation category. And project teams are having a challenge getting products that met all three of those categories. So we've made them each standalone categories now within the low emitting materials credit. So that projects can focus on, on these smaller sets of materials or products to be rewarded with more incremental, so that we can reward incremental achievements. So maybe you couldn't get ceiling walls and insulation, but if you could get insulation, this will allow you to be rewarded and to get credit for, for what you were able to achieve within the, within the, the system. So the indoor air quality assessment credit, um, we have created um, two options. So the way the credit is currently set up, there's a flush out option um, and there is an air testing option. So the intent of this credit is to establish better air quality after construction and during occupancy. And you could either achieve that through the flush out or through the testing method. And with the testing method, it was kind of an all or nothing. You had to do everything in the air testing <coughs> section. So what we have done is we've created two um, air testing pathways. We have one for particulate matter and inorganic gases, so that's kind of pathway one. And then we have one for volatile organic compounds, so it's pathway two. So maybe you can't get all, everything that was required in the, in the current version for air testing. But this way you're allowed, you can, you can, you can do partial, you can do the air um, particulate matter and inorganic gases and, and the VOCs. We've also reduced the list of VOCs that you're required to test for in the building based on what we expect to, to be in the building. Um, for the daylighting credit, um, we have removed the 10% threshold for annual sunlight exposure, and we have adjusted the threshold at all point options. So, so the, the option one, two, and three, we're now making it more uh, approachable for all project teams. And finally, there's a new exemption for the 300 lux value if you preserving automatic, um, with, still with having manual override, glare control devices are used. And I think we're very ambitious with the acoustic performance credits. Um, the for only rating system that had acoustic performance credits prior to lead version four was lead for schools. So in the lead for schools in 2007, we had an acoustics credit for lead for schools. With LEED for version 4, we wanted to expand that, and we wanted to expand that based on research from the Center of the Built um, Environment in Berkeley showing that you know, LEED projects, projects that were certified by LEED, were not performing. The occupants were not happy with the noise levels in, in those buildings. And so we were very, very optimistic with what we, we tried to, to put in place. So what we have done is we've actually reduced the scope of the acoustics performance credit, um, updated the requirements for sound transmission, and we now give projects the flexibility on how to classify spaces. And so when I say classify spaces, we were very prescriptive. We said if you had a standard office or an executive office, this is what the noise level had to be. Or if it was a conference room, this is what the noise level had to be. So we've, we've changed that a little bit and, to, and defined spaces more as collaborative spaces, private spaces, confidential spaces, or multi-use spaces. So it's not as you know, specific as, as the way the rating system um, was prior to that. Um, we've also eliminated the sound masking uh, requirements. So there were four options in the acoustics credit. We took away the sound masking requirement and we still have the, the requirement for HVAC background noise, the sound transmission, and the reverberation time. And this credit, the, in terms of scope, you have to at least achieve two of those three credits or you can achieve three for exemplary performance. So we're hoping that this means 
that project teams will be able to better utilize um, a, a statistics credit and to be able to make spaces better for the building occupants. Now I'm going to turn this back over to, uh, to Melissa. Thank you, everyone. So now we have probably about 30 minutes or so for questions. Um, I have a few questions for the panel, and I don't think you're getting off the hook and having to answer some of the questions that we've thrown out for you. But I would also encourage folks, if you have direct questions, please come to the microphone. We are recording, so we want to make sure everyone can hear you and we, we capture your questions. So feel free to, to queue up as we're talking. Uh, the other thing I was just going to say, you know, because you've been with us for an hour and a half, we have a little bit of, uh, I think about like the New Orleans term, little lanyard, that little something extra that you get for being here. All of the credits that we've talked about are in the credit library. So if you want to see the details, you get the first preview. Go online to usgbc.org, look in the lead credit library. You can take a look. They are draft, LSC has approved, but you know it's not officially launched, but it's a good chance for you if you want to see the details of what everyone talked about. So you all are the first to know. Uh, that's our <laughs> gift to you. You get the, the special sneak preview. Um, and that, that is up. It's live now, so you can take a look. And if you don't know how to get to the credit library or you're not using it, let us know. because It's a really valuable resource, and I, I think sometimes it doesn't always get recognized. So please take a look at that. So I thought we might start just talking about the question we threw out, which is, you know, how can lead really continue to lead? Or I'll say it this way, if you ruled the world, what would we be doing going forward into the future? Um, we're going to ask you guys the same question, but maybe we'll start here with the panel. Gina, you gave us a little bit from LSC, but I think you want to expand on that question. Sure. What do you see going forward? So I think that we're really excited about the, um, the progress that we're making towards the top end of the performing projects. So, you know, to be able to really continue leadership on especially energy and carbon and push projects to do more. I come from a, a, a code and, and um, regulatory perspective where we have for several years been operating above the standard that was adopted and used by me, which was disappointing because we're constantly struggling, struggling to try and get other jurisdictions to push their market forward. And LEED was not encouraging them to do that. So now that's changed. Under 4.1, we will see a very high bar set for energy and for carbon. And I think from my perspective, uh, LSC and the TAGS want to do more work to figure out how we pull more projects in at the bottom, especially when it comes to existing buildings. And so our work is not done. It's always continuously evolving. And just because we've made all of these incredible achievements on 4.1, which I am really blown away personally by all of the work that the TAGS have done over the last year, but we have a lot more work to do. And I think that's really the, the next key challenge for us to figure out is how do we pull more of the market into lead? How do we get those projects that are really performing poorly um, in the existing building market to be attractive to lead, use it as a tool to improve their performance? And that's a real challenge that I think we, we have more work to do, and I think USGBC is very committed to that. We can add to that. I'll add, um, Jeff, I, I work for I rule the world. I think that we all have to recognize that we can't achieve our goals in a vacuum within our lead boundaries, that we have to extend beyond them and participate with our utilities, whether it's our energy grids or our water utilities or um, even our own communities for social equity uh, and, and health of our communities purposes. So uh, I think the next step is to try to break down those boundaries and maybe uh, provide some tools for project teams to use uh, throughout the US, throughout the world, of uh, how to uh, successfully uh, make those first steps to be more inclusive and, and broaden uh, the intent of the mm -hmm. uh, 
I, I would agree. I think as we definitely need to do that. But I also, besides working together, I think sharing the business case for what we're doing and really, there's, I think, a lot of awesome examples, and I don't think we necessarily highlight the business case for, for doing need. And I think that would really be a, a positive way to, to keep us moving forward. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tie down to Amy's answer and just also say that if we could have all the buildings that have certified really start to enter their data, and we have a free platform for everyone to start to put in data to build those, the business case and to share out what is happening within those projects, I really think that would also change the game for us. We're, we're planning to do that. We have about 3,000 projects now using the ARC platform, and of course some of those are achieving O&M certification that way. But I think that's really our next big challenge is getting all those new construction projects. So we've got the new International Green Construction Code was just announced, so as we start to see projects meeting those code, green code baselines, getting them to report data. So even just the act of reporting is a huge step to getting that data and starting to prove performance. So definitely uh, one of the things that we want to keep working on. So I see we have a, a few folks lined up. Thanks for a great presentation and lots of information. I had two questions for you. When new version 4 was announced, there was the ability to utilize certain V4 credits if you were in a version 2009, if you were in the middle of a version 2009 project. So is that a possibility with version 4.1 or still determining? Yeah, sure. <coughs> um, so in we wanted to make sure that we finalize the rating system first before before we come up with the rules for using credits for right. um, But yes, I, I think that's something we are looking into and, and would like to offer once this rating system is, is publicly available. I think the challenge is that um, we've raised the bar in some areas and lowered the bar in other areas. So you know, we obviously don't want people to just grab the easier credits but in some cases, in other cases, we, we do, and that's, and that's okay. So we might come up with, with a list of, of how to actually do that credit substitution and which, which credits it can take as a, as a version 4 project. Um, I think most projects are going to want to upgrade to, to 4.1. I think on the whole, it's going to be a rating system that, that's, that's more usable. Um, so we would certainly encourage projects to do, to do that. But we also realize you know, in some cases, projects are 75% of the way through just like to, to grab a few other new credits, and that's something we'll most likely allow. And then for the data reporting, is there going to be a consideration of projects are required to report for five years? Has it been considered in the corporate one to just make that reporting required in the arc so that the data, like USGC, has the data instead of just gen generically reporting right now? I mean, we certainly. We would love to talk to have everybody do that. We've encouraged it by making it free. We haven't necessarily made it mandatory yet that ARC is the only place to report that data. Um, and I'd love to hear feedback on that. But it's, it's free now if you've got a certified project. So, it's, and it's I agree, it's very helpful to have the information in one centralized database. Great, thanks. Thank you. So, what, going back to the goals for version 4.1. One of the things that's most challenging to me is to try to get my head around the two goals of maintaining leadership and removing market barriers. Because when you think about those two things, they're sort of immediately, they seem like they're directly in conflict with each other. And so I, I see how that was sort of addressed in, in the changes that were made. But I was wondering if people could speak more to that challenge of what's the difference between a market barrier and an opportunity for market transformation? Or how do you balance those things? Yeah, I can start you know, if anyone else has any thoughts. Um, um, so I think, I think we are not achieving our goal if no one is using these. And I think you can, you can say that on a credit by credit level too. So if, if credits aren't being achieved, if we've set the bar too high um, and, and no one's achieving these credits, then, then we're not really meeting our mission. So we are not being that leadership standard if, if, if no one's doing the same. So you know, that's, that's the evaluation we, we did when, when looking at version four. Um, and I think we also need to look at goal number one, which you're talking about as well, in terms of maintaining a leadership position. And you know, we have to recognize when, when we sort of 
thought we were being a leadership, taking a leadership position, and uh, you know maybe that was a little too far. Um, we we really do need to balance those two those two goals, and there is no right answer to any of this. And I think that's why it's all so so hard, it's so difficult for uh, us to develop this training system. We do the best we can to, to set to set the targets and to and to write these credits and to put it out into the market and, and see what happens. And I think that's what we're recognizing with 4.1, that we need a way to adjust a little more quickly and hopefully the beta can help us do that. So if we're not, you know, if we're not setting the bar as high as the market thinks we should, we'll find that out in, in the beta and we can, and we can adjust. Um, and to me, I see it, and maybe we, instead of removing barriers, it should have been adding stepping stones. Maybe that's a more positive spin because removing barriers down a little negative, but to me, what at least with the EQ credits, what we've done is we've allowed sort of stepping stones to get to that goal. So instead of saying, "Sorry, you can't get across the river," we're going to say, "Here are the steps that you can you can achieve that are more easily achieved, so we can start getting you to that leadership position to where we want you to get." I don't know if that helps. And, and I think that also relates back to the importance of collecting data from projects and how they're performing. And and relates back to what I said about segmenting markets, which is not something that is easy to do now in Reed's current form. But as we have more data in the future, we may be able to adjust the weighting or how credits are approached in different regions, maybe internationally versus domestically, or maybe even within different parts of the United States between urban and rural projects. Like, for example, I often tell people, if you're in the city of New York and you achieve these silver, well, you had to try really hard not to. <laughs> so there are different aspects that make, make performance easier for projects with certain credits, whereas it's very difficult for other projects. And I think in the future, the amount of data that we will be able to collect will help us maybe resolve some of that in future versions of the Great presentation, and uh, it's really exciting to see the credits up on the credit library logged in. They're there. Pretty cool. Um, so hopefully we can start using those really soon in January. Uh, my question was about the energy scale. One of the things that I've seen that's most exciting is that when we look at this combined cost and carbon metric that we're using in BDC, we're going far beyond where we were in terms of the potential savings that we are recognizing. We were uh, stopped at 40%, I believe, before from those projects. Can you talk a little bit more about how that's been expanded and, and what that might mean? Um, just to clarify the question, um, yeah, how... Yeah, not, not a good question. So, if, uh, if, if I recall correctly, and looking through things, it looks like the carbon scale goes up to 100 mm -hmm. or zero. So. We're, we're now, so talk about what that means. For we're, we're down at 40, essentially. Uh, was it the, the ASHRAE scale that was up there? So, so right, right now, we're under version four. If you get to a 40% savings, you get all the points available in energy. And you don't get any more if we're, you go Where the point place. scale is? But we're now the point scale is all the way. Yeah, right. Um, I would have to uh, go online to see to remind myself exactly what the point scale is. I don't remember it off the top of my head. But um, the way the credit was structured previously is that we had, there's 18 points available in the um, uh, optimized energy performance credit. Um, we, we split that in half, and half of the points are achievable for energy uh, cost savings, and half of the points are available for carbon. Um, in terms of energy cost savings, sort of uh, in reflection of what we saw in the ASHRAE um, uh, chart, um, you're not going to be able, without renewables, you're not going to be able to get to net zero. Um, what is sort of maximally, if maximally achievable, is maybe a 50% energy reduction based on the current energy code in 90.1 2016. So the, the nine points max out at 50% uh, energy cost savings. Um, on the flip side, in the, uh, the nine points available for carbon, um, we, that, that percentage carbon savings uh, goes all the way up to 100%. So you only get those nine points, the full nine points, maybe plus one more point, I don't remember, um, if you are able to get 100% carbon reduction. So that's essentially net carbon zero. I, I'm a structural engineer that actually works for a general contractor. 
So I'm naturally more interested in the materials credits, which you said you can't talk quite a bit about. Um, but I know that the achievable rate for quite a few of them has been pretty low. So I didn't know if you could speak to um, any efforts to increase participation, particularly in the um, full building LCA credits. Um, I'm really sorry, because I do have more to share on that. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> and I think um, Amy uh, said it well a few minutes ago in terms of adding stepping stones for these material credits. And I think we we had the right idea in version four. You know, I think we, we still stand behind the restructuring of that materials category uh, in terms of what the what the long term vision is here. Looking at materials more holistically, adding LPA, looking at you know optimization and disclosure. Um, so we still we still like that structure, and, and I think. Many manufacturers have uh, invested in, in what Meet has done, and we want to reward that and, and continue to push that. Uh, but it is adding those adding those stepping stones. So I think for LCA, that's that's another example of a credit where you know we were trying to understand. I believe we had three or four points for LCA in version four. How we can more award more sort of incremental credit for um, uh, for various levels of, of achievement of, of life cycle assessment being done on a project. So uh, again, the language isn't finalized yet, but I think you'll see more more points available and uh, maybe you know a point for just doing an LPA, not necessarily showing any specific results. Um, <laughs> and more points for higher levels of achievement. So. And one announcement that I, I realized I forgot to add in that also happened on Tuesday is that we are also working with the HPD collaborative now as well, and so hopefully you all heard that, but that was another, um, you know, similar to the conversation around BRE and just in terms of joining together to continue to scale, getting information out there and, and making it very accessible to project teams. So we really are, I, I think Amy made a, a great point that we're seeing change in the market and we just want to accelerate that change. So adding the stepping stones, working to accelerate the change with those who have been out there the last 10 years and, and not moving away from the strategy, but just enhancing it further. Hey, um, my name is Susan Gaika. I work on a lot of projects international, um, and we do energy models for those. And what I found is with those uh, really high performing projects, that process part of it really becomes the instrument of the, the whole um, achievements, like a project with a lot of process power, are just naturally at a big disadvantage. And I was wondering if the version 4.1 is addressing that at all, and how that's handled. I, I think it's that about it. <coughs> so, uh, NOVID has always uh, accepted uh, exceptional calculations to address process power energy reductions. Um, it, depending on your building typology, you might have a, a large load that really can't be moved, and that will continue to be a challenge. Um, so, LEED is not, uh, LEED version 4.1 doesn't address um, a, a process loads broadly, but there's certainly the data center um, the guidance, um, there's, there's health, there's different typologies, there's healthcare uh, adaptation. So, there, there continues to be a different scale for typologies that we know of that are common. Um, that will struggle to achieve various uh, higher levels of achievement of cost comparative or, or carbon comparative reduction. Is there also going to be something for manufacturing? Yes. That exists already, actually. Yes. We had a wonderful industrial facility in these years that has worked hard on those pathways as well. Yeah, we've certified the uh, CML and the uh, like 99.9% process power. So um, the challenge we have come across is that we are comparing for a five-year baseline, but those mills are not built now. They're more like on a 15, 20-year scale. So it's really hard for us to show improvement to a mill that is brand new and now becomes our new baseline. Sure. Yeah, no, I would just add to that question. Um, like Melissa said, we do have a lot of manufacturing compliance paths that we that are that exist in as interpretations. Um, we've also we are going to be exploring thresholds for those high process load facilities and, and whether we do need a, a separate threshold uh, point distribution uh, table specifically for those because they do have challenges. <laughs> the, the 
far. We've generally said it's over 60% cost of loads, so I think, yeah. That's something we didn't include in 4.1, but we'll continue to evaluate that during the beta. And since we're here, I'll put in a plug for the other, our counterparts on our, our overall technical team. We have excellent education team. There's over 400,000 hours now in the uh, education at USGBC platform, which if you're a member, you have access or you can purchase access. And it's one of those benefits that I think a lot of people just don't take advantage of. And it does get into some of these very detailed conversations. We've had some fabulous instructors. So take advantage of that. And then the other, our third piece, we have a wonderful team of technical solutions folks who are there to help these specialized market sectors. Um, they're actually all here in the room today, so thank you guys. Um, and if you are working in some specific project types, and especially if you have larger amounts of projects, please feel free to reach out so that we can really help you, help you understand these detailed paths, potentially customize new solutions if needed. Um, it's definitely what we're set up to do, so we've got lots of resources for you. Hello, uh, Hakan Akin. Uh, with regards to the future of LEED or wherever LEED is going, there was an announcement that you mentioned as well that there's a partnership now with BRE, Green. So what do you expect out of it uh, in the future? Uh, will, will, there, will there be a merger between USGBC <laughs> and Green and or, or uh, a single platform, a single rating system globally or will there be more competition? So especially for a lot of international projects, yeah. which one would be more preferred? It's all very good questions that at this point we don't have answers to in terms of, which I think you probably knew I wasn't going to stand here and announce a, a merger of, of Lean and Green. Um, so let's not start that rumor. Definitely right now, just looking at how we can collaborate and scale together. I mean, as you can imagine, the number of certified projects, there's a lot of data and a lot of lessons learned out there that I think we can both use to inform our work and figure out ways to really, you know, to scale on both sides. Um, so definitely, I think a place just to, to um, watch the website and watch the announcements over the next few months as we start to work through some of those details, there'll be a lot more to come. So I don't have a ton of detail for you today, but it's coming. Uh, Pamela Lippi, E4. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend everybody up there and all the other volunteers for all the incredible work you guys have been doing to uh, to do this incredibly important work of, of both raising the bar and making it more market accessible. Um, I noticed that there was no mention of the construction waste management credit, and I'm curious if that means that there will be no change to it. Um, you know, I think I it's one of those credits. Being a New Yorker, mm -hmm. I think it's one of those credits that is. Uh, regional, you know, has some problems related to it, uh, regional and urban, and, you know, it, it is almost impossible now to get, pick up both credits in the New York area uh, because of the nature of how construction waste is done there. And uh, so, you know, I'm just curious, if it wasn't mentioned here today, does that mean it's not going to be addressed in the update? No, we, we definitely have heard the same New York, D.C., any metropolitan area is struggling, so we've been looking at how to adjust that. I think, Amy, you mentioned I did, a little I bit did, of detail. I did, so in, in urban areas, we're absolutely going to resolve that issue or attempt to resolve the issue that, that you stated. So we're, gonna, we're looking at pathways for urban areas and how to handle that construction waste management issue, specifically in urban areas, because we've definitely heard you. We've heard it through the proposals we, we received that, that that is an issue, and it's definitely something you're going to see changes made in the rating system. Regarding your other question, if you didn't hear it today, probably yes, that means there are not major changes. There might have been some minor little things that have been changed, but what we reviewed today were the major changes that we're going to be seeing in, in 4.1. Thank you. Great. I don't know. Can I get a quick time check? Sorry, guys. I didn't Ten minutes? Ten minutes? 12 minutes. Oh, 12 minutes. Great. Oh, good. We even have another question. Excellent. I may have not been uh, paying enough attention to what you said, but if I understand correctly, all of the credits, which you've mentioned up here, changes. First, they have to be approved by the Lead Steering Committee, and then they're going to be for use on January 1st? Yes. So we, the Lead Steering Committee has approved everything except, as we said, materials and resources, which we'll, we're working on um, to, to move to them pretty quickly. 
So the plan is that we'll put out a draft just before the holidays so that everyone can take a look. Like I said, you guys got the sneak preview. Uh, and then in January, we'll fully launch open registration, have all the supporting materials that go with it, and that's really when we open up the beta for use for projects. So we're close. LSC has done a great job of also moving very quickly, as we all have. Um, and so everything that's in the credit library has been approved by the lead steering committee, just not open for use yet by projects. And then my question, because I'm most interested in the materials credits. Sure. When will we see the changes in the materials credits? I think by the time we open up the beta in January, we'll be. have those. Okay. Um, that's certainly the target okay. um, we're, we're working on. Good. So. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, adding on to materials and resources, um, I flew out from California. I was really interested and excited to hear what was going to happen related to materials and resources and some of the points. Uh, in particular, certification for the construction, demolition, recycling facilities. Um, I've got 30 years in the materials and resources field, 20 of that in government, both local and state level. Um, I'll, I'll say that this is an interesting group that we deal with that handles these materials, probably more dynamic and interesting than any of the other parties that we talk about. Um, I've worked with the state attorneys general on human trafficking, uh, money laundering, um, uh, drug smuggling, tied to this particular industry. Um, when you had the slide there showing green and blue, green being easy, I guess it was the green being easy to achieve, blue not so easy to achieve, Construction material management was, was green. Everybody's doing it because they're writing numbers that you like to hear. Mm -hmm. People can do that easily. It's important to incorporate some form of third-party verification and auditing into these facilities to ensure that they're reporting the right numbers, particularly as it focuses on the performance management of LEED. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we can certainly connect you also with our, our staff member who works on materials and resources as well to just to share that feedback, and he can give you a little bit more detail on the conversations. I don't know off the top of my head if we have any more detail right now to, to we've, talk about that. We've had a pilot credit for certified mm. uh, facilities, okay. and that was certainly part of the discussion for 4.1, whether that's something we can include in the rating system language. Um, I believe we're not requiring it in 4.1, um, but it is... Uh, you know, I, we'll have to get you more detail on exactly how we incorporated it, um, but I know we've seen good feedback related to that pilot credit, and I think that's definitely the direction we're moving. So. Can I just say there's only one in the tri-state area? That's you know, the problem. Yeah. You know, it's like one facility, so it's just not happening. We've heard the same in D.C. Um, as well, that there's just not enough certified facilities to really push it into the full requirements yet. Are there comments, questions? I'm curious, Melissa, if we, it, it's great to get that kind of feedback for LSC and for the tags. Are there other credits that anybody thinks you wanted to hear about a change that you didn't hear about? I would, you know, encourage you to come up to the microphone and share those with us and just kind of to test the reception of this is all a lot of information to take in at one time that you've probably been thinking about some of these these changes already if you work with the rating system often. Are we all right? <laughs> this was a lot of work. I'm only seeing one yeah, thumbs right. up. <laughs> all right. So thank you. Good. We're, we're really looking forward to getting the feedback from the beta. We think that we, we did a lot to improve it, and uh, we, we can't wait to hear what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also where the idea of credit substitution will help, too, because if there's a credit that a project's been stumbling on and they can take it from 4.1, drop it into 4, we'll get direct credit feedback as well. So I think that'll be good. And if you'd like, we, we will be at our booth. Uh, it's 1111. So I think, Corey, you're there for part of the day today, amongst others. So. If you, if you don't want to shout it out right now, you can also come and, and talk to us directly throughout the conference. I do have one consideration about the uh, transportation credits for uh, O&M. Uh, we own and manage buildings right here in the Chicago suburban market. So um, when we look at transportation surveys that include miles driven, 
um, in a state where people are taxed so high that everyone's going to the perimeters and commuting in from Wisconsin and Indiana. Uh, it's not unlikely for some of our employees to be spending 80 miles on the road every day. So is there any alternative? Maybe in the works for suburban markets where we don't have public transportation, people are in their cars solo, and um, you know we've had some success with uh, the previous transportation credits and being able to get you know credits for telecommuting, for um, you know hybrid cars, for electric cars. Um, are all those things in consideration? And how do we address this um, in the suburban market, suburban marketplace? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think. It's, it is a challenge for suburban projects to score high when it comes to the transportation uh, credit in, in O&M. Um, I think telecommuting is certainly an option that we give credit for. So that would be, um, that would be one strategy that you could potentially use. Um, I think the, one, of the, one of the changes with 4.1 is that we now have a relative scale for transportation. So um, in version four, it was an absolute scale that is looking at you know, how many single occupancy vehicle, uh, uh, trips you actually have, and, and you would only score points based on that absolute scale. Now you are compared against your, your peers. So uh, I think we might be able to find ways to uh, segment that market and, and compare suburban against suburban and, and urban against urban. Um, some of those details we'll be working out over the next year, but I think we have, we have that flexibility to be a little more granular in terms of um, encouraging different types of behaviors for different projects. I'll just put a quick plug in as well. 4.30 today, right here in this room, we're going to have an hour session on uh, 4.1 EBOM beta and with some users of that, some feedback from projects. So we'll get into that kind of issue in a lot more detail if you're here. Yeah, thanks. That's a good reminder. <laughs> Residential will be here at 3 and then O&M is 4.30, Chris? Okay. So yeah, back in this room, we have a few more uh, of our, and then tomorrow morning, if you want to hear about codes and scoring in ARC, those are the two morning sessions. So we have quite a bit of uh, content. And I think also, as we have done in the past, I think we can grab a lot of this content and start to share it out as well as part of the education platform. So uh, even if you aren't able to go to all those sessions, we'll make sure that we, we get that information out to you as well. So we have five minutes. I'm going to take our last two, and then we'll do a, maybe a closing round with our panelists. So please, go ahead. Thank you. I wonder if someone can just address why you split up the IQ testing. Um, it seems like uh, you know, if you have, if you're testing for VOCs, you can have dusty air, or if you're testing for particulates, you can have a bunch of VOCs. Someone could maybe just address that. I, again, it's kind of that stepping stone approach. So we would rather see people addressing one or the other as opposed to neither. And so that was really our, our thought in breaking those two out, was that we, we want to see people doing those credits. And maybe they can't do the whole thing, but if they could do part and then the other part. And so it's, it's an additive credit. So it's one, one point for doing you know, the particulate matter and the inorganic gases, and that's another point for, for VOC. So the idea was to, to really to break down the barriers, but to be able to get more people using the credits. Thank you. Sure. Thank you all for presenting today. Um, just logged on and was looking at the credit library. <laughs> and my, my question, I'm feeling a little bittersweet. So, you know, I'm a contractor. We work hard to, you know, go after those BPDO and low emitting credits for the design team. Um, so, you know, we've worked hard and we've achieved them on the current level. Um, so I'm happy that, you know, the thresholds are, are lowered to 75%, et cetera. So I feel more confident in achieving them. Um, just finished reviewing the proposed DC Green Code, and they actually have a threshold of 85% need to have the emissions and VOC content. So just questioning 4.2, 4.3, like what do you all, how do you all see this now that cities are going to start adopting what you all have already laid out to meet their goals? So, you know, are you all already looking into the future and, and setting up to now take that? I know you had to take a step back to keep it achievable and make people pursue it. So what's the next step to then, okay, we're going back or, or forward, but back to the higher threshold standards? 
I want to jump in and answer that because I don't think we're stepping back. I think we're creating a path forward. I, I know, and I think maybe it's just the terminology when we say that I don't want that misnomer to be out there because I don't. We're not stepping back. We're creating this way to move people forward, just in a in a in a more you know smaller step process. Understood. So the next step will be point two, five, yeah. and and are there dates associated with that because. You know, as more cities start adopting, mm -hmm. hey, this is going to be code. This is required for all projects. Okay. How does the USGBC project to stay in front? Well, and that's certainly, I, I think, part of what drove the ASHRAE 98.1 2016 decision making mm -hmm. was really pushing, and that was a big part of the feedback that we got was keeping pace with, it's with cities, regional, you know, areas that are adopting more stringent codes or pushing, like New York City, um, as Gina mentioned earlier. So we do want to. We're very aware of that, and we do want to keep pace with that, and we want to hear from you all on sort of where we are relative to where you're going. Um, and then, you know, I think it's all on the table. That's part of what we talked about earlier in terms of modifying the development cycle. We can do a point two. We can do a point three. We can continue to move, you know, maybe there's a credit or two that needs to be adjusted based on the beta feedback before we even go to public comment. So we do have a bit more flexibility. Um, certainly, there will be a five at some point. We don't have a set date yet, but I think within it, um, you know, kind of like software development will, will be a bit more iterative and be able to, to adapt more quickly. Um, and sometimes that may mean raising thresholds. Sometimes it might mean just adjusting approaches or adding different tiers as well. So I don't want it to, sometimes it freaks everyone out if it sounds like we're just going to keep making it harder and harder, right? So part of the leadership is also Comment, you know, bringing more projects in, getting those that are using IGCC, for example, on the path to lead, um, et cetera. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your great questions. Um, I want to open it up to you all on the panel. If we have anything from a closing round perspective, any last thoughts before we close out? I, I just think it's exciting what we have achieved. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that. We, we talk about what's not working and what's not right, but we have achieved so much and we've achieved it together. And I think that it's so important that we continue to work together across you know, functions and organizations because I think that's the way we're gonna continue to drive changes and really to have that leadership going forward. And I think it's important not to lose sight of that. Absolutely. I, I think you can count on LEAD becoming um, better and better, just as you know, we've seen a lot of evolution over the last 20 years and how it's changed. And, and uh, I'm very excited about the idea that we'll be able to start looking more strongly at embodied carbon mm -hmm. and not just operational carbon and uh, really beginning to look at more health and social equity issues. That's a, a new one for me, certainly. The social equity issues are around um, waste recovery. Um, CND waste recovery is really interesting. So uh, I think the folks that are working on this are bringing really great ideas to the table, and we're always just trying to strike that balance between what kind of incremental changes can we do without really um, turning people away from lead and, and um, I'm really excited about what we've ac accomplished in version 4.1. We have already started talking about what's in 4.2. Yeah. And again, thinking forward on a roadmap of how much can we do at, at one time. We have the same discussion with the codes as well, and a lot of states are really backing away from a three-year three -year code cycle, whereas other states like Maryland and Massachusetts and New York are, they're sticking to that three years. We have to do this. So it's, it's a common theme in our discussions. Yeah. I, I mean, I completely agree. I'm, we're very excited about what we have in the rating system. And what I really appreciated over the last year and a half, and, and also in what I've seen in the sessions today, is everybody's willingness just to roll up their sleeves, and get to work, and dive in, and do the credits, and refine the credits, and then say, you know what, we've got to get solar, let's pay for solar in Texas, even though we're in California. And so everyone's just like, okay, we get the urgency, we're going to get to work. So that's really awesome, guys. So thank you. Thank you, panel. Thank you, everyone here.